So recently, and at long last, I was finally able to try out Darrington Press's new game system called Daggerheart, which is most likely going to be Critical Role's new game system. So I got my gaming group together and we played Daggerheart. And while I normally don't like to beta test game systems, I felt like I had to give this one a try because it's being made by Critical Role's Darrington Press, and I felt like I was hearing so many good things about this game even though it's only in beta. So I felt like I had to give it a try for myself and really see if it's all it's cracked up to be. But as opposed to a lot of other videos that I've seen that talk about playing Daggerheart's open beta in person, this video is going to be a little bit different because I ran this Daggerheart open beta quick start adventure the same way that I always run my adventures and sessions, which was online using Foundry VTT. So I'm going to be sharing some of my players' thoughts as well as my own thoughts and experiences of this new and budding game system. But before I do that, Hello, my name is Nate Mon, and I'm a game master who has been running my game sessions pretty much exclusively online using virtual tabletops for roughly 10 years at this point. And as someone who's been recently trying out a lot of new game systems, Daggerheart included, I feel like Daggerheart brings a lot of cool stuff to the table, and some things that I don't necessarily like about the game system. But with introductions out of the way, let's get into the details. So to kick things off, just about everyone in my group made their own characters using Demiplane, and their experiences with creating their characters was pretty good, because Demiplane made it super easy to create a character and manage that character, and manage all of the unique resources that are used when playing Daggerheart, like hope and stress. I mean, like, look at this. You can hover over or click on anything on this character sheet, and it will give you any information you need to know about that feature, class, spell, or rule. Like, I can click here and get information about my domain. Or I can click here if I'm not good with using numbers and have it calculate how much HP HP I have to mark off depending upon how much damage I took. Honestly, Darrington Press partnering with Demiplane to release all of their beta test content was such a smart move by Darrington Press because not only was it super nice to have an online character creator that streamlines the process and makes everything really easy to understand, but also, in my opinion at least as a game master, it was so nice to have all of this information in a digital format and hyperlinked so that I could quickly access information by hovering over a keyword or a reference to a character or a location, or I could obviously just word search for something if I wanted to, meaning that I didn't have to flip through tons of pages and waste tons of time just to find one specific rule or information regarding something in the adventure. But while I really like the character creation process because of how simple it seems and all the cool details that they include, there are some things that I don't like, specifically with the experience mechanic, which we'll get into here in a little bit, so stay tuned. But moving on to the quick start adventure that's included with the beta test, be warned that- Wait, 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 I was literally just walking. Hello again, viewers. It is I, cautious disclaimer of the wary. It has been some time. Be warned that this video contains content about the Daggerheart open beta, and there will most definitely be topics discussed that some would consider to be spoilers. But now that you have been warned, let us resume the video. Mm -hmm. The fucking wizards, man. Anyways, so since I ran my game session online, there was a little bit of work that I had to do in regards to taking the assets that the adventure has and moving them onto Foundry. But honestly, Demiplane made that really easy because all of the documents and assets that they had were either PNGs or I could easily just crop them out of the token PDF document that they provided. And finally, for the fear tokens, which is a resource that a game master can kind of accumulate throughout a game session, I decided to use not a digital tool or a digital representation for them, but instead a physical representation for myself, obviously, because the players don't really need to know how much fear tokens. I necessarily have. So what I decided to use was things that I always have at my desk during a game session, which is snacks. So what I did was I took a paper towel and laid it out in front of me, and every single time I gained a fear token, I just took a snack out of the bag and then put it on the paper towel, and every single time I used a fear token, as I'm sure you're probably guessing by now, I just ate one of the fear tokens, or snacks. And I thought this was kind of a fun way to represent my fear tokens and to use them, and obviously it was a great excuse as a game master to just kind of eat your snacks while you're playing the game. But overall, in case you're curious how long it took me to set all this up on a VTT, I think everything from like the character artwork to the scene artwork to monster tokens to the battle maps and all that stuff took me roughly around 20 or so minutes or maybe 20 to 30 minutes to set up. But now let's actually get into what I thought about the adventure and how it played running on the VTT. First off, the adventure went really well, or at least I think so. There were a couple of times when our D20 system wired brains had to adjust to this new D12 system with all the new terms and rules, and there were probably one or two times at the beginning of the adventure when we had to double check some rules relating to combat, which kind of put things on pause for a couple of minutes. But besides that, there weren't any major issues that happened mechanically. Also, since Foundry didn't have a Daggerheart game system at the time we played through the Quick Start Adventure, I pretty much just used the VTT to show artwork, provide ambience and sound effects, and of course to show where enemies and players were located. And regarding how we rolled dice, we either rolled physically or used Demiplane, since it's a little difficult to use dice so nice with the whole hope and fear dice thing. But regarding NPCs, I really liked all the characters that the adventure throws at the players, and I thought that the adventure gave you plenty of information to properly 
roleplay those NPCs. I also thought that each encounter worked really well and added to the story, well, ex maybe except for the first Most Festival, which we'll get to in a second. But I also thought that it was really cool that the adventure specifically encouraged the Game Master to involve the players in building a scene and atmosphere if they were comfortable doing so. Like, when the players go up to the second story of the Clover Tavern and the adventurer says to ask the players, how does the second floor of this tavern look so wildly different than the first? This is a great way to involve your players in the world building process that us game masters are so accustomed to, and can be a really fun way to see your players kind of come up with a scene in their head and then share it with the other players and then watch their reactions. Because I feel like a lot of times us as game masters, when we describe things, sometimes we kind of get caught up in our own heads with describing a scene, especially if we're ad-libbing it and kind of coming up with it on the fly. So we don't really get the time to look at everyone's reactions. So this was really cool to kind of see everyone's reactions when a scene was developed, not by the Game Master, but by the players. And I was thinking about this after the game session ended, but I can't actually really remember off the top of my head if I've ever played an adventure or a game system where in the text of that adventure, it explicitly encourages the Game Master to involve the players in the creation of a scene, or world building, or let them describe a particular detail of what they feel like the atmosphere is like, or what the bartender looks like, or things like that, which I thought was really cool. And while I loved this adventure and everything that was included with it, like the NPC scene and encounter artwork, which they definitely didn't have to include, but they still decided to anyways, I felt like for a session, or for a adventure that was meant to be completed in one session, there was one thing that kind of felt out of place, which was the first Moss Festival. I personally didn't run this encounter because after all, it is optional and my group had a limited amount of time to complete this quick start adventure, which for us was four hours. But I don't know about you guys, but for me, I felt like the first Moss Festival was kind of just a time waster because in an adventure that's meant to be a one shot, or at least that I think is meant to be a one shot, I felt like an encounter like this, which is really fun in the regular campaign, don't get me wrong, it's just a waste of time. And especially since the players can't like learn anything or get anything from this encounter, like they can't learn about a monster that's coming ahead in the adventure, or they can't obviously barter or purchase items or things like that, then I felt like this encounter was just kind of useless. And obviously as the game master, I could have gone ahead and changed or tweaked this encounter, but I felt like since this was a quick start adventure meant for Daggerheart and kind of meant to be the introductory adventure, I didn't want to tweak things. I wanted to leave them how they were and see what an unaltered adventure for Daggerheart was like. And at the very end of the adventure, I admitted to my players that I had skipped this optional encounter and kind of explained to them what it was and what you could do and things like that. And they were a little bummed out, obviously, but they also admitted that if I did run this encounter, they probably would have spent the rest of the session getting up to shenanigans at the festival. And while we were talking about the first Moss Festival and everything that you could kind of do at the festival and things like that, one of my players brought up a topic that they had mentioned previously in the adventure, which was, what is the purpose of gold in the quick start adventure and in Daggerheart itself? which I didn't really have an answer for. But before you get in the comments, I know that obviously gold is a currency that you're meant to use to purchase things in Daggerheart. But in the quick start adventure, there's never really a time for you to mess around with the currency system, unless of course you extend the adventure beyond the quick start adventure. And as it currently is, at least in my opinion, I feel like it's a little too vague and incomplete. I understand what they're going for because they're trying to obviously give the game master tons of creative freedom with designing their world and the currency and things like that but I feel like this just gives a lot of unnecessary work to the Game Master that they have to do before a campaign or before a session. I was also a bit disappointed that I couldn't find a sentence anywhere or like a graph or something that explains what the average Joe makes each day or each week in terms of gold value. Because in most game systems, at least with D&D and Pathfinder, I believe, there is at least one little clause or sentence that explains, okay, one average person makes about one gold per day if it's hard labor or whatever. Or in Pathfinder, I think it's like one gold piece per week or something like that. But in this beta test adventure and in the resources they provide, I couldn't find a sentence like that that really explains what the average person makes per day or per week in terms of a handful of gold or maybe like a single gold or something like that. I also assume that this is meant to help things move a little bit more smoothly in the average session because players aren't worried about marking down five cover pieces for their lunch at the local tavern or marking off seven silver pieces for transportation to a nearby town. In Daggerheart, it's just a simple handful of gold, which covers most basic purchases, I guess. And so with that being said, I wish that this adventure had a section of it that allowed your players to mess around with Daggerheart's current system and give their opinions about it, because I think that this could be a really cool and nice change of pace for players and especially game masters who are a little sick and tired of worrying about specific currencies. And I can only assume that the reason why they are trying to make gold values so vague is to obviously simplify the shopping process and to obviously make it so that way game masters and players don't have to worry about specific gold values. Like for example, uh, wait wait, so you have how many platinum pieces? Okay, so that's that amount of gold pieces. Okay, and how many copper pieces do you have? 
Okay, cool. So we can actually uh, convert that into gold pieces, which brings us to like 242 gold pieces. Shoot, we need 245. Um, hey, Game Master, can we uh, maybe haggle for a lower price? Like, you know what I mean? Like, there's always times during a shopping session where you kind of begin to stress over these specific gold amounts for items and things like that. And I think that this game system is trying to take away from that or more so remove that entirely from shopping sessions and make them a lot more quick and concise. I say this because I'm sure Critical Role, as well as every other Game Master who's ran a campaign before knows, shopping sessions take up a lot of time and can literally take up entire sessions, if not like half the entire session of players just kind of going through the item lists and haggling for prices and role playing with the shopkeepers and things like that. So I think that this is kind of meant to at least reduce that time by a little bit. But hey, those are just my thoughts and opinions on this new currency system that Daggerheart is trying to use. But let me know what you guys think in the comments down below, because I'm actually really curious to hear what you guys think about this new kind of vague currency system, which is a huge breakaway from D&D's currency system, which Critical Role, as well as so many of us, are used to using in our game sessions. But moving on to game mechanics, I first want to mention that with my size of group, which was five players, not counting myself as a player, by the way, I felt like I was getting fear tokens constantly, and sometimes I felt like I was getting them too often. Towards the beginning of the adventure, I was a bit hesitant with using fear tokens because I wasn't sure how often I'd get them, and I didn't want to make encounters too difficult because I wasn't sure how strong monsters would be. But as the adventure progressed and I got more confident using them, I was burning these things left and right, and I still felt like I was earning them back just as quickly as I was using them. And then once the adventure ended, I think I still had like 5 fear tokens left over. This could be a bit of an issue mechanically speaking, because if you were in a campaign using Daggerheart with a large group, Due to how often the players are rolling dice in and out of combat, the Game Master can get a lot of fear tokens before the next combat encounter, especially if you're running a campaign where combat might not happen all that often. So theoretically, depending upon how often combat encounters occur, the Game Master could have full fear tokens every single time a combat encounter begins. And I know that there are varying uses for fear tokens that Game Masters can choose from, including special abilities that monsters can activate. But even during combat, I felt like even when I was burning these fear tokens left and right, I was still getting them back at a pretty regular pace because of how many players I was running for. And I just felt bad about constantly using special ability after special ability or rolling with advantage after rolling with advantage, if you know what I mean. So I feel like there should be maybe a limit or something to how many fear tokens a game master can use during a combat encounter. And obviously I know that once they run out of fear tokens, they're out, but I still feel like there should maybe be a limit to maybe how many you can use during a combat encounter. Like maybe you can only use a maximum of 10, and even if you regain fear tokens, you can't use any more. Or maybe the amount of fear tokens that you can use changes depending upon the difficulty of the encounter. Like during a boss fight, maybe you can use 20 fear tokens or something. But I feel like this would be a good way to kind of balance out the fear mechanic because, and after all, it is still in beta, but I feel like the fear mechanic is still a little bit unbalanced or needs a little bit more work. And it would also be a cool way to kind of add more strategy to being a game master during combat encounters. But speaking of combat encounters and fear, I really liked how they ran on the VTT and I thought they went really well. And personally, I really liked the hope and fear mechanic that Daggerheart introduces because it's kind of like almost an inspiration or a hero point mechanic from D&D or Pathfinder that players can use in so many different ways and unique ways. And speaking of combat encounters, I really enjoyed all of the combat encounters that were thrown at you during the quick start adventure and thought that they all ran really smoothly using a VTT. And I don't know if you guys know this, but in Daggerheart, basically every single attack thrown out by the player hits, which may sound a bit boring, but since the player's attacks hit a lot more in Daggerheart than in other game systems, the feeling when a player misses an attack is heightened even more, because it means that the Game Master's turn starts, and all those action tokens become the Game Master's. Additionally, combat felt a lot easier for the players in this game system than in others, which could be a bit of a turnoff to some of you out there. This is mainly because of the hope mechanic, players generally always having more HP than their enemies at level 1, and I think statistically 2d12s are a little more reliable than a single d20, but don't quote me on that. Plus, in Daggerheart, Game Masters can't crit with their attacks, which I think is meant to balance out the fear mechanic. But I would be lying if I said that I didn't get a little sad when I rolled a natural 20 during our game session, only to remember that game masters can't crit, or at least in Daggerheart. And something that I began to notice towards the end of the session was that the game system almost encourages players to not take very many actions when it's their turn in combat. 
Since Daggerheart has no initiative order, which is another massive breakaway that this game system does as opposed to other popular game systems like D&D and Pathfinder, which do have initiative order, it's honestly pretty great, because as a game master you don't have to worry about the initiative order anymore, and as a player it means that you don't have to worry about rolling really low on your initiative and then having to wait for all of these players and monsters in front of you to go before you actually get a chance to do something. So for those of you out there who may be a little confused at how combat works if there's no initiative order, basically how it works is that there is the player's turn and then there is the game master's turn. The players all get to operate on their turns simultaneously and kind of describe what they want to do alongside one another and then obviously take turns rolling dice until one of them fails at a check or rolls with fear, at which point it immediately switches it over to the game master's turn. But when running an encounter using this kind of method for initiative, there were some issues that I began to notice, especially running for a group that is so used to using a game system with an initiative order like Pathfinder or D&D. So for example, I was running for 5 players, so theoretically if each player took 1 action and didn't miss or roll with fear, then that would be 5 action tokens that I could use when it became my turn. But an issue that happened a couple of times was that when the player's turn would start, everyone would kind of be silent for a couple of seconds until one player would volunteer themselves or someone else to go first and attempt to do something. This sometimes led to a player failing their dice check or succeed but roll with fear, which then led to the player's turn ending and the game master's turn beginning, and many times, this led to one or more players not getting a chance to go before a player turn ended. This is because if people start acting all willy-nilly and rolling dice and using actions carelessly, then the Game Master gets free action tokens essentially, and you could completely ruin one of the other player's plans if you end up cutting them off or if you fail a check before everyone has gotten a chance to say what they want to do. But this was a learning experience because with how the game system is currently designed, it seems like it really wants to encourage teamwork and communication before people start actually taking actions and rolling dice. But once we ran through a couple of rounds of the beginning combat encounter, my players truly got to get a feel for how Daggerheart combat worked, things began to run a lot smoothly once they began communicating. And speaking of smoothly, the character sheet on Demiplane does a really good job of easily displaying where your character's attacks and spells are, how many hope points you have, and all your modifiers. Additionally, on the Game Master side of things, the NPC sheets for monsters are simple, easy to read, and devoid of clutter that could confuse you during combat, which I really appreciated. And especially when you compare them to D&D's NPC sheets, yeah, they're a lot easier on the eyes. But I really hope that they keep this minimal design slash look for the NPC sheets, but of course some colorful designs would be appreciated, and maybe they could make these NPC sheets into cards that the Game Master can easily reference. After all, there isn't a whole lot of information on these NPC sheets anyways, and it would kind of fit with their style of implementing cards into a game system. And while none of my players died, or really got close to dying during this quick start adventure, I love the death mechanics that Daggerheart introduces. Each of them, in my opinion, are fantastic, and most importantly, give your players options to choose from regarding how they want their character to go out in a blaze of glory. Something else I love about this mechanic is that it can be super important to players who may have been in the campaign for months until they actually reach a point where their character could die. So giving them some options to choose from on how their player goes out rather than just having the character outright die is awesome. Plus, this allows the players to decide if thematically it feels like their character's time is up, or if they want to fight back against fate and continue the fight. But if no one dies and the combat encounter goes pretty well, but people are still looking a little injured and low on resources, then that's where the resting mechanics for Daggerheart come into play. The resting mechanics also seem well thought out, and I love the strategy that goes into choosing what you should and shouldn't do during your rest. Additionally, I love how Daggerheart gives players who may not have spent very many resources over the course of a day or during a combat encounter the option to help their friends by repairing their armor or tending to their wounds or helping with stress. I say this because maybe you guys have also experienced this in other game systems, but sometimes when you're playing a game system and your party begins a short rest, long rest, or whatever sort of resting mechanic your game has, sometimes that means that you just do nothing. Sure, you get all your resources back, but for you, the muscle-bound airhead barbarian, resting is just your time to sit back and let the other players do their thing and listen to the game master describe what happens during your rest or what happens during another player's watch. But with Daggerheart, this situation doesn't really happen, because resting is a time where you need to decide if you want to lower your stress, restore some HP, or maybe repair your armor, or maybe help one of your friends do any number of those things. This mechanic allows every player, regardless of what choices you made during your character creation in regards to class, experiences, and things like that, to help in some way, shape, or fashion, or to do something during any rest, which I really like and my players 
thoroughly enjoyed. Honestly, this is such a good mechanic, and like I mentioned earlier, me and my players loved it. But that's pretty much all I have to say regarding the game mechanics and how they worked on a VTT when playing this Daggerheart Quickstart adventure. Overall, all of the mechanics worked pretty well, and they all felt pretty well thought out and designed. And while this game system is still in beta, honestly there were times where I forgot it's in beta and this isn't like the official release or a couple weeks before the official release, because it felt like a basically completed game system. But the fact that Daggerheart is in beta right now and it's still has so many great mechanics and works so well is honestly a testament to how well Darrington Press have designed this game system. But with that being said, I still have some issues that I wanted to talk about, like I mentioned earlier. So firstly, I want to talk about the experience or experiences mechanic that Daggerheart introduces because it is yet again another breakaway from a classic or more traditional definition of what experience would normally be in a MMORPG or TTRPG. I personally really like the idea that Daggerheart was going for in regards to giving the players the ability to give their characters any sort of experience they want or add their own personal twist or flair to their character without having to worry about predetermined or pre-made backgrounds or skills or things like that. But despite what I said earlier about liking or perhaps appreciating would be a better word for what Daggerheart is trying to do by breaking away from those predetermined lists of background features or skills or things like that that so many other TTRPGs have kind of adopted, I'm not really sure how I feel about not having those lists, if that makes sense. The beta test is sure to explain that the experience shouldn't be too broad or mechanically oriented, which makes sense. But the problem with having an open-ended mechanic like this that lets the player choose essentially whatever sort of experience their imagination can conjure up, that may mean that the game master and player can both have vastly different ideas and perspectives of what situations would and wouldn't be applicable, which could lead to some butting of heads, I'll say. So hear me out. Let's use the example that the beta test provides of Assassin of the Sapphire Syndicate. So one would assume that this means that you can use this experience to get a boost to a stealth roll, or in a dialogue encounter with someone from the Syndicate. But if the game master doesn't sit down with the player and clearly define what your experience can and can't be used for, or what situations it would and wouldn't be applicable in, then a player with a fairly or semi-vague experience like Assassin of the Sapphire Syndicate can just essentially bend that experience to be applicable to any situation. You could argue that as an assassin, you were highly trained in conversation and deception, so you could apply your experience to any dialogue encounter, which is reasonable. But then you could argue that being an assassin of the Sapphire Syndicate has also given you experience with crafting weapons, breaking down doors, or recalling knowledge about someone you just met. And I think you see where I'm going with this. And after hearing this, you may say, Nate, buddy, players get experiences like every other level on Daggerheart, so just tell the player to be more specific when making their experiences, or they can just build onto an experience once they unlock a new one. And those are good ways to deal with this issue. And if the game master has to put up some restrictions about how each experience can be used, or tell the player that they can't expand the possible uses and situations where their experience applies until the next time they unlock an experience, or that they need to be very detailed with their experience names to avoid confusion, then why doesn't Darrington Pro just make a list of pre-made experiences with a skill tree type progression. I feel like this would make a lot more sense and this would help Game Masters for Daggerheart so much because it would mean that Game Masters don't have to keep a series of notes that detail what each player's experience can and can't be used for. I feel like that this just makes a lot more sense than giving your players free reign over experiences and then leaving all of the work of governing, establishing, and remembering what your experiences can and can't be used for up to the Game Master. And I don't know about you guys, but this mechanic just kind of reminds me of when I would run D&D pretty frequently and I'd have to write down and remember all of the rulings for some of the vague rules that D&D has or all of the house rules that I would implement in my game sessions. And I don't know, I just feel like this mechanic adds a lot more unnecessary work to the game master side of things and is a bit of an oversight, or at least in my opinion. But what do you guys think? Is this a hot take or do you see some reason in what I'm saying and maybe agree with what I'm saying? But speaking of confusing rules, there were some other things that me and my players noticed when we were going through the quickstart adventure that we were just either really confused about or felt like needed some more wording to kind of clear things up specifically regarding some character features. Like for example, the Rogue Nightwalker feature called Shadow Stepper allows you to essentially teleport to any other shadow that you can see, which is really cool but is a little bit vague in how it works and how it's worded. Like for example, if a creature is up on a ledge and you can see the creature but you can't see its shadow, 
can you still jump to its shadow, or does that not count? Or does it really just come down to the Game Master's ruling? Or does using this ability cost an action token since it's a feature and has a spellcasting tag, and if it does cost an action token, does it still count as movement so you'd no longer be invisible if you were hidden previously? This was one of the issues that caused us to pause my game for a little bit, because mechanically, at least with our first go around of the game system, it seemed a little bit confusing and felt like this feature was meant to be used both in and out of combat, but had a bit of that classic D&D vagueness spliced into its wording. And if it is meant to be used during combat and costs an action token to use, which is the conclusion that me and my players came to, if I'm remembering correctly, then that's just giving a free action token to the Game Master just to move, which is normally free as long as you're within close range, which is 10 to 30 feet. And then on top of that, if you attack after you use this ability, that's an extra action token that the Game Master gets when it's their turn. So is it even worth using at that point? But then after all of that, if the answer is, oh, well, it's not really meant to be used during combat, it's meant to be used outside of combat to sneak around, then players don't really get a chance to use this feature during the quick start adventure because it's so combat heavy, and if they try to use it outside of combat, to like break into a store or do other rogue things like that, they may entirely derail the mission or adventure. And if this is how it's meant to work, which I think it is, then I'm guessing it's a way to balance out the rogue class since they can do a shit ton of damage at level 1. But due to the short description on the feature card, it can be a bit confusing, especially for us since we're not super familiar with the rules and this was our first time using the game system, and it seems like they purposely made it a bit short and vague so that way it could fit on the card along with the cool artwork. And this is one thing that I really hope they fix or at least tweak with Daggerheart because on one hand, while I really appreciate them making things vague and kind of short description to allow for more creativity and for you to run your game session and use your spells how you want to, on the other hand, I feel like when they make things this vague, it just puts more work on the GM's plate in regards to making rulings regarding these vague spells and things like that, like I constantly had to do when I played D&D regularly, which just kind of gets annoying after a little bit. And speaking of cards, the Daggerheart method of doing things by making like your ancestry and your features and things like that cards is really cool, and I really like my cards. But this is completely useless, and the cards are completely useless if you're playing on a VTT, just straight up. And trust me, I understand that this game system wasn't designed to be played on a virtual tabletop, but since VTTs are only growing in popularity, and since the cards themselves aren't actually used during a session or combat, like you don't throw them down to activate an ability, or combine them with an allies card to activate a super ability or something like that, then they're just kind of cool looking. And that's it. And despite all these gripes or issues that I've kind of talked about so far, I honestly am really excited for Daggerheart to be officially released because I think once this is a final product and is all polished up and nice and pretty, I think it will work and play super well on a VTT like Foundry VTT or Alchemy RPG. But all of this is to say that Daggerheart definitely feels like a game system made for and by Critical Role. It's a very thematic game system that sometimes uses vague language and terminology on purpose to give the game master and players creative freedom, and seems to be a game system that favors dialogue-based encounters and thematic fight scenes that require little strategy and will statistically always lean in the player's favor, as opposed to game systems that have combat encounters that could swing either way because of a few critical hits and require a lot of strategy and teamwork to win those encounters. Personally, I think that Daggerheart will be a huge hit, and I think that it will be an even more huge of a hit if they plan on partnering with a virtual tabletop to make Daggerheart a supported game system and release Daggerheart content on a VTT marketplace. I think that it's a good sign for people like me and perhaps you that like to play on virtual tabletops that Darrington Press has already partnered with Demiplane to release all of this content but we'll have to wait and see what they do next. But with that everyone, those were my thoughts and opinions regarding playing Daggerheart and my first impressions using Daggerheart on a VTT, and I hope you enjoyed, and if you did, be sure to leave a like and a comment down below in regards to something I mentioned in this video, or perhaps maybe your first experience or impressions using Daggerheart. But as always everybody, thank you so much for watching this video, and I hope to see you in the next one. Take it easy, Bye bye